for the location. Um, having said that, next month it will be a different location again. So please check your emails. Uh, the college will keep you updated. Uh, the topic for today's talks are uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, we're very privileged for, uh, for the first talk to have Dr. Stuart Brown present on capacity assessment in uh, brain injury. Uh, Dr. Stuart Brown is a senior rehabilitation physician and he's the medical lead of the brain injury community rehabilitation team at Royal Rehab. He also provides a clinic service on mild TBI in Royal North Shore and moderate severe TBI at St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, those of you who've been lucky enough to do a brain injury term at Royal Rehab will know how valuable his uh, teaching is and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of what looks like it'll be a very interactive session today. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Patrick. So thank you. Are there a group that just arriving? So those people who have just arrived uh, in the last few moments, I've got to get you to get out your phones and go into your browser and log on to live.boxvote.com. Two at the front who need to do it. Who else needs to log on? No. Everyone else is okay. So, you've, have you found that, uh, ladies? So then, when you log on, that screen comes up, and I want you to put in that number four double one six zero, and then hit OK. So I think we can get straight into it if you're, if you're logged on. So we're going to do a test question. What day of the week will Christmas Day fall on in 2118, 100 years or so from now? And I'm going to give you the option. I'll start this and I hope it should come up on your phones now. If you need to reconnect, you can hit the reconnect button and a, a question should come up. Oh, it's not coming up for me. I don't know if it's coming up. For, there it is. It's coming up for me. Yep. So if I could get someone to, uh, every, sorry, everyone in the audience to put in their vote. And... I've got to keep refreshing, but I don't want to keep refreshing and give everyone clues to it. So uh, I guess that in, in this world of digital voting, I probably still need to get hands, show of hands to say who's voted. Who's voted? I hope everyone has. So uh, we've got nine, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and a 14th person just entered the room. Um, three, of you uh, three of you chose Sunday. Why have you chosen Sunday? It's first. It's first, right. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're gonna find you get 25% if you do that. <laughs> but it's actually correct. It is correct. Uh, so. What I'm, so it is, oh, someone else has added. So a couple of extra people have added Sunday. So very well done. <laughs> no wonder who those people were. Um, so let's go back. So Sunday is the correct, is the correct answer. So uh, the last couple of people who just entered, can you put your hand up if you haven't logged on, if you're not onto it? Um, I'm the second presenter. Oh, you're the second presenter. Okay. So everyone's logged on here. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve we've got. We only had eleven just a moment ago. But anyway, let's move on. Okay. So this is uh, going to be our, uh, hopefully our way of getting some responses from everyone in the audience. TW is a 44-year-old man with a very significant history of alcohol dependency. And he lives alone, no family, no, uh, you know, a few friends. And he receives a little bit of assistance with paying bills from his landlady. In 2010, he was assaulted quite severely and suffered a closed head injury. 
and he presented initially to Gosford Hospital and then was transferred to ICU in Liverpool. Here's a picture of his brain. Uh, that's just one slice and he's got a lot of frontal and, uh, and parietotemporal impairment. So, we're now going to get to the next question and what I'm going to have to keep doing is clicking out of this and starting up. So, right, go live. So, if the patient is unconscious, who needs to give consent for emergency treatment? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so just re just refresh, just refresh, because I've actually opened up a new, a new, uh, so, oh, hang on, it's because I haven't hit start. There we go. That should come up. Has it come up? No, still hasn't? Perhaps you should end the event and then start it again. If you can end it. Leave event and then reconnect. So it's everyone's back on again, are they? Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm trying to use it as minus testing, but for some reason mine's not working. So has, has everyone, is everyone, work, it's working for everyone. Yep. So has everyone voted? Wow. Excellent. So only seven people have voted. So there's six or so of you who haven't voted. Who hasn't voted? Still looking. Oh, it's still not working. What did people do to get it to work? Leave event and then just log back in again. Right, so we've got nine voters. Ten, right, getting there. Still ten. Okay, we'll move on because hopefully, um, hopefully you can get back in. So, so no one is the correct answer. And why is no one the correct answer? Because the guardianship legislation shows that it's an urgent, an urgent uh, treatment where someone's life is uh, at stake or serious injury, then no one needs to consent. And the recommendations are, even though no one does need to consent in the emergency situation, that it's probably reasonable, if possible, to get a person responsible um, it's also very sensible to document your actions and perhaps get more than one medical opinion if that's possible in the time. So indeed, he did undergo emergency treatment and then he was transferred to the general ward and he becomes agitated and restless and he requires arm and chest restraints to prevent injury to himself and others. Now, who needs to give consent to the application of arm and chest restraints. So we'll go back to our question and I'll bring up the next question. And hopefully, do I need to hit start? I'm not sure, I think I probably do need to hit start. Question two come up. Yeah. So who needs to give consent? So NCAT, you may not know who NCAT is. That's the New South Wales um, Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And it's, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but it, if it treated as though it's the Guardianship Tribunal. So can we have a look at responses? Only seven, so still waiting for people to answer. You shouldn't have to. Should. Pardon? No, you don't need an email. No? So it's not working for you? I did that. Is that okay? It is. <laughs> well, it's a bit hard because I've got to display it all. So, uh, uh, 
Yeah, you can do it straight away. So let's see how many voters we've got. Nine. Who, who's put in a response? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it looks like 10 to me. Yep, okay. So three of you are still not voting. Okay. Um, any comments? We don't know, clearly. <laughs> so you're kind of an even split there. NCAT, the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, otherwise uh, or previously known, or part of it was previously known as the Guardianship Tribunal. Why, why do we need to get consent from NCAT to apply arm and chest restraints? Because the, the legislation shows that this is a special treatment and they're the type of special treatments that you need NCAT consent from or NCAT approval from. And they include aversives, mechanical, chemical and physical. Who's applied to NCAT in the past to get consent to apply chest restraints or a lap belt uh, or giving someone some medication that's going to slow them down a bit, a chemical restraint. Yeah, no one, I suspect. Right? And that's what happened in this situation. NCAT wasn't contacted even though they are meant to be contacted. But as is often the case, the need for restraint reduced and everyone was happy just to continue. He's eventually transferred to the brain injury unit uh, where he's alert and wanders and he has a focal seizure and it's re uh, necessary to give him an anti-seizure medication. In TW's case, who do you gain consent from to administer an anticonvulsant? The person responsible, NCAT, no one, as there's no person responsible or a hospital medical director. Let's go back to question three. And I, I don't know if I have to keep getting started all the time, I probably do. So if people can put in their response. One voter. <laughs> Is it not working? Is that why? It's just a refresh. Mm. All right, you're getting in there pretty quickly. That's good. A couple more. Still thinking, still thinking, people thinking, should I go with the majority? Should I go with someone else? Nine voters, I'm, I'm trying to get to 10. It seems like 10 has been consistent, although I think there's more than 10 of you in the room. There's 10, okay. Who, who said no one as there's no person responsible? Can you explain why you've said that? Uh, I, I think you're close to that. Um, I think you're close to the answer. Absolutely, that is the right answer. No one, no one needs to consent to giving someone an anticonvulsant. Uh, why is that? The NCAT legislation considers anticonvulsants and uh, this list of other medications such as analgesics, antipyretics, antiparkinsonian medications, etc., as minor treatments. And who can consent for someone to have a minor treatment? Well, the person responsible can, but there is an exception that if you can't find the person responsible or the person responsible is unwilling to provide consent, then it is possible for the doctors to provide that treatment without consent. However, it is always sensible to document who you've spoken to, why you've come up with this decision. So, Prescribing an anticonvulsant is in someone uh, in someone in our brain injury unit, for example, uh, is not required consent so long as you document what you're doing. 
However, VW objects to the anticonvulsant. So what do you do now? You give him the <laughs> you give it in his medic in his orange juice. Do you establish if he's competent to refuse treatment? Do you accept his right to refuse medical treatment, or do you contact NCAT? Go to the next question, and we will start. Two voters. Four voters. Six. Six still. Come on, I want you to get up to ten. Ten voters. So two people said contacting NCAT and uh, and eight said go to go to uh, uh, to establish if he is competent. Well these questions aren't necessarily meant to be straightforward, but uh, the majority of you got the right answer. Uh, why why might con contacting NCAT not necessarily be the right answer? Pragmatics is probably the most obvious solution to that. If we were going to NCAT all the time, we wanted to make certain decisions, there's no way they have any time to, to be able to do it. And there are guidelines that NCAT provide to allow us to hopefully establish if, if someone is competent to refuse medical treatment. So I'll go on. How do you determine, how do you determine if TW has capacity to refuse medical treatment? Do you assume he is incompetent because he has a TBI? Do you ask a neuropsychologist to perform a detailed assessment? Do you ask him relevant questions relating to his decision-making ability or do you contact NCAT? Let's go back to the, to the quiz. For people who have arrived late who want to get involved, um, maybe someone next to them might be able to tell them what, what they've got to do and the number is 41160. Let's have a look at what our responses are like. Oh, we haven't got a lot. People are thinking. All oh, right, okay. I don't know why it's... Uh... Is it safety in numbers or do people want to be bold? So I've got seven there. We're up to eight. Nine. Still nine. Still nine. Still nine. So has someone not voted or there we go. So three and seven. Good. Let's go back to here. We ask him relevant questions relating to his decision making capacity. Who are the who are the three who chose uh, the other one? Asking uh, that was a neuropsychologist, I think, wasn't it? Is that what the, or was it the first response? In fact, I didn't even notice. Neuropsych. Yeah, uh, probably the same answer that I'll give to this one is is the one to the previous question. If we got a neuropsychologist all the time, we needed someone to give us some idea of whether they were competent, then we would need a million neuropsychologists. So we can make a step uh, to cut out the neuropsychologist and go into a little bit of knowledge about assessing someone's competency. People, have, people who are competent have the right to refuse medical treatment. But if you uh, go against someone's wishes, someone who is competent, for example, then that constitutes battery. That is a, that is a crime. But importantly, if someone is incompetent, and a typical situation might be someone perhaps who is demented, who might have depression, and the person thinks it's all a bit too much, to go on to an antidepressant or something like that. So they may refuse to have an antidepressant medication. In that situation, the, there is a duty of care of the doctor to, to be assessing the competency of this patient because you don't want to withhold treatment from an incompetent person where you have assumed they were competent. Do people understand the distinction? 
So there's a duty of care there. The law states that all adults are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, and the burden of proof is, is a balance of probabilities. And in this situation, in a medical situation, the doctors uh, provide an opinion, and in my experience, the doctor's opinion is usually held quite well by the guardianship tribunal. Importantly, a person must be proven to be incompetent before it is possible to override their decision. So what is competence? Competence and capacity are, are effectively the same. Competence is the, is the legal term, capacity is the medical term. So we, we use them interchangeably. So it's the ability to understand and uh, provide decision-making ability. That's what competency is. Importantly, it's task specific. So you can be competent to do, uh, to respond to one particular uh, issue, but be incompetent for another. And a common situation in our clients is that someone is deemed to be incompetent to manage their financial affairs, but they are deemed competent to manage other aspects of their health care and their decision making in terms of where they live. Doctors give an opinion in regard to uh, establishing someone's competency. So I've mentioned that it's, it's used synonymously with capacity. So how do we determine competence? Well, there's no single test that we can do. People have responded a neuropsychological assessment. Yeah, that can help. Um, but in Australian law and British law, we kind of default to uh, a case known as RE-C that happened in the 90s. And we, we use that as a guide, really, to how we assess competency. So I'll just quickly describe C. He was a 68-year-old man. He was schizophrenic and lived uh, permanently in a psychiatric hospital for the insane, for the criminally insane in the UK. And in 1993, he developed gangrene in the foot. Surgeon said that uh, they recommended amputation. But C said, no, I'm not consenting to that. I only want debridement and grafting. And ultimately, that's what happened. And that proved successful. However, the surgeon said, it is likely we'll have to amputate at some point in the future. So C applied for an injunction to state that he would rather die with two legs than to live on with just one. And so the issue was, did C's mental illness make him incompetent and therefore unable to exert his right to refuse an operation? And just for background, at the time, he was extremely delusional. He thought he was an internationally famous doctor. He'd never lost a patient in his entire career and, he, and there were persecutory delusions also. So Thorpe was the judge, and Judge Thorpe found the man to be competent to refuse his uh, surgery on the following grounds. The judge found that C was able to comprehend and retain relevant information in his case. He believed the information, and that's an important aspect. So the doctors were saying there's a good chance you're going to lose your leg because the vascular supply is really critical. So he believed that. He wasn't delusional and thought, no, I, I have this incredible power and I'm going to overcome this. And similarly, he was able to demonstrate how he weighed up the information that he was provided with and he was able to come up with a choice. And so as a result of the judge being satisfied that he met those grounds, that he was deemed to be competent to make that decision. He may have been incompetent to make many other decisions. Now, in the US, Grisso and Applebaum, have, uh, uh, they're considered authorities in the area of competency and capacity, and they've written extensively, and uh, they provide valuable guidelines, valuable support in this, in this area. And they looked at uh, four features of assessing capacity, and, it, and it's listed as understanding the, the situation that uh, you're discussing, appreciating the information, so believing it, in other words, demonstrating a capacity to reason, to, to weigh up the information, 
and then demonstrating that the person is able to independently make a choice. So looking at the UK re-C case and the US correlation, they're, they're very similar in that Judge Thorpe called it comprehend and retain the information as opposed to Grisso and Applebaum talk about understanding, believe and appreciate are used synonymously, weigh and reason are used synonymously, and choose and evidence a choice are deemed synonymous. So how do you how do you do it then? If we've got these four terms, what do you do? Well, Grisso and Applebaum explain that you ask the patient questions. You don't need to go to a neuropsychological assessment you ask the person a series of questions that are gonna to touch on those four categories, understanding, appreciating, reasoning, and demonstrating a choice. So the first thing you wanna do is get the person to give some description as to what's going on, and to get them to, importantly, demonstrate that they can retain that information. So someone who has significant memory impairment is going to be questionable regarding their competency because they may come up with a different answer every day of the week because it's entirely new information to them. So demonstrating an ability to retain their, their, uh, their information is important. And then you ask about appreciation or believing as, uh, as Judge Thorpe talked about. So going through what the person thinks about their illness, what they think will happen, um, what are the options that they may have and what would happen if they chose a particular option? They're all pretty straightforward questions and they come out in an interview. And just carrying on, so reasoning, asking the person how they've come up with their decision and then asking them, okay, tell me what your decision is. And this is an important, an important point in that you can you can uh, come up with a decision that the vast majority of us would, would think was wrong, but if you can reason and demonstrate why you have made that decision, then you can be deemed to be competent. So you don't have to come up with the right answer is the important thing. And that's probably true of a lot of life. If you can, if you can defend why you've chosen a decision, then most people would think you competent. So let's get back to our scenario. So TW, we, define, we, we determine that he is incompetent. He remains in post-traumatic amnesia. He's got extremely impaired new memory. He doesn't know where he is. And he's confabulating quite extensively. And he says that um, he's got a work van out, out parked out the front. Of, he didn't really know he was in a hospital. But anyway, he's got a work van parked out the front. And it's costing him thousands of dollars a day to hire. So he's got to get back to work. So I've got to get out of here. So if TW is incompetent to refuse the medication, who can consent to its administration? Let's go back to the quiz and I'll have to get it started again. So is it not necessary to get consent? Is it the hospital director? Is it NCAT? or is it the person responsible? So who, uh, so remember he, can, he didn't want to take the medication, so who can consent to us giving him that medication? Seven voters, still seven. I'm hoping some people might have logged on who, who have arrived late with some guidance. Come on, we still need 10, we need 10 people. Nine, nine, still nine, still nine. Come on, who's the 10th, who's the 10th? There should be more, I know, I know there's more than 10 of you out in the audience there, so. Uh, no, it looks like we've lost our 10th. Are they having trouble getting in? Okay, I'm gonna go out of that because I don't wanna keep spending too much time. So, who can consent to the administration? Anyone? Person responsible, yeah. So, I, which was, in fact, I'm not actually concentrating on what the, I'm just concentrating more on hitting the button. So, so what was the longest bar? Not that. Not that. It was NCAT. 
Why NCAT? Because anyone who objects to non-urgent treatment requires NCAT to give to override that. So, so NCAT is the only person. So it's considered an objection to non-urgent treatment. So let's keep going. So interestingly, at the same time as this has been going on, TW's brother arrives from across the other side of the country and he's only just found out that his brother was injured eight months earlier. His behaviour worsens. He becomes verbally and physically aggressive. He starts climbing walls. He's trying to get out of the hospital by climbing over a very high fence. He's paranoid and he wants to harm himself. You want to start a lanzapine, which I, I can tell you is a reasonable, a reasonable uh, choice. So who, if anyone, needs to give consent to the prescription of a lanzapine? Let's go back. And start. Is it that no no consent is needed because it's minor treatment? Is it his brother who's not long arrived? Is consent not needed because it's urgent treatment? Or is written consent from the person responsible required? Let's have a look what people are answering. We've only got three voters so far. Four. Six. We got, we're going to have more than 10 of people logged in. So people are getting panicky. I should say there's a prize to the person who gets the most uh, answers correct. So uh, 10, excellent. We've got 10. Have we got more than 10? Have we got more than 10? We've got 11, excellent. Someone's entered who hadn't entered before. And this is obviously a pretty tricky question because it's a pretty even split, really, I'd say. Have we got more than 11 now? We've got 11? Okay. <laughs> Who said, uh, uh, look, well, because we've started a bit late, I'm going to head straight back to our, to our thing. Recent consent from the person responsible. Does TW have a person responsible? Why do we need consent from the person responsible? Because prescribing an antipsychotic is considered a major treatment. And there are other major treatments, although a lot of the major treatments are exclusions of urgent and minor, as, as you can see um, if you read that list. And I'm gonna, you're gonna be able to access this after the presentation, so you don't need to, to look at it in too much detail. So the person responsible in this situation can consent, but if you can't find the person responsible, or again, if the person responsible is unwilling to consent, then you need to get NCAT as well. So this is a major treatment. So who's the person responsible in this particular situation? Let's go to live again. Is it the brother? Is it the landlady? Do we need to establish it by NCAT or is it the rehabilitation specialist? <coughs> and I'm sure they're responsible. Let's have a look. Need to establish the brother. So nine voters. This is good where people are getting it, getting it a bit quicker. Come on, we need 10. See if we can get to 11. Come on, get to 11. Yeah, there's 11. Okay, so a lot of people are thinking, well, a slight majority think, oh, 13, excellent. And N NCAT's just bumped bumped up. Have we got more than 13? No, okay. So that's a pretty even split, six versus seven. So we need to establish it. We need to establish who is the person responsible and uh, Usually, in so in TW situation, you probably need to get NCAT advice. You don't always have to get NCAT advice to establish who the person responsible is, but there are a few uh, issues with this with TW situation that might mean that the brother isn't automatically the person responsible. The hierarchy for 
uh, assessing who is responsible is a guardian who has been appointed by the guardianship tribunal or an enduring guardian if the person had previous to their injury appointed such person. Then comes a spouse, and I'm impressed to see that the legislation is or, or, the, or the documentation at NCAT is already updated for same-sex partner, which is excellent. Um, and then next is a person who, who helps the person, but not for money. So they're not getting financial reward for assisting a person. And then last is a close friend or relative. Again, as long as they're not getting financial benefit. So in TW's case, NCAT decided that a public guardian was most appropriate. And their reasoning was, even though the brother well and truly fitted on that list, the brother only found out that his the TW was injured eight months after his injury. So it was deemed that there wasn't particularly a, a close relationship there. Additionally, the landlady could have been assumed to have been the, the uh, person responsible, but again, she was collecting money so it was deemed that she was not necessarily appropriate. So in this situation, a public guardian was, uh, was uh, uh, made uh, to be the person who was going to make decisions. That was provided in writing and the documentation by the public guardian stated that the medication at a specific dose and frequency was allowed to be prescribed. Oh, sorry, how, how long does it take for the process? Once you yeah, so you it, that's a good question. Remarkably oh, quickly, remarkably quickly, especially if you know, the same no, not in the same day, but, but it depends on the urgency. This wasn't a particularly urgent one, but if you want to do something urgently that's not urgent life-saving, but urgent, for example, restraining someone, then you can get same day, you can get same day consent from NCAP for that. It might be on the phone as you're speaking to them, because usually what they want to do is get together a, a tribunal of three people, and that usually takes an hour or two, but they can get back to you within an hour or two and say, yes, you have consent to lock this person in their room because they're at risk of injuring someone or themselves, and they will give you a time span as to how long that can last. Mr. Bonner, you mentioned the care of all um Someone who's not receiving the remuneration, does that have to be established by someone or is it just following? Yeah, a good question. Uh, look, um, it, it would be nice. So if, if you didn't go by NCAT and you chose to go to the landlady as the person, you'd want to be documenting in your notes as to why you've chosen that person. It would be much better to send that to NCAT. We're nearly finished. So TW um, then has the police turn up because he was assaulted, of course, all those months ago. And the police want a statement regarding his current status and prognosis in the matter of the criminal assault. So who can give the clearance for the release of a report to be tendered to the court? A guardian with this power? Oh! Yes. Dear me, <laughs> dear me, oh, terrible. Who would have put that? Be honest. So the rehabilitation specialist, yeah, maybe. The police request must be obeyed is probably the important thing to understand there. And the brother. 100%, oh, we're getting good responses here. Those people who weren't looking, I suspect. Or we're looking, or we're looking. Come on, only six, eight. If you want to win a prize, you've got to be in it to win it. The rehab specialist. I can tell you it's never the rehab specialist. <laughs> it is the guardian with this power. Police come all the time into brain injury units and I suspect other units as well, but especially in traumatic brain injury and probably traumatic spine injury units. And the police don't have to be obeyed because there are some very important principles and one is privacy, medical privacy, and you can't just give out information about someone. Even more so, 
if the person is incompetent to give out that information. So you actually kindly say to the police, and they come in usually with guns blazing and uh, wanting their report pretty quickly, and you say, excuse me, um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't give out that information. We will need to explore who is going to consent to the release of this information. So a guardian with that power. But of course, the guardian that we'd already got didn't have that power in their determination. They only had the power to give consent for accommodation, healthcare, mental and dental consent. So what did we do? We informed the public guardian and we kind of came to the conclusion that, look, let's be pragmatic. It was probably in the, in the client's uh, best interests that we release this information because ultimately he might be able to get some compensation through victims of crime. And so there does need to be some police documentation that a crime uh, occurred. So in the interest of, uh, of pragmatics, we, we mentioned it to the client <laughs> who of course is incompetent, uh, we documented it, and so it goes. I should just point out that this particular client, when um, was unable to recall any of this information, and I took him around because a couple of politicians came to have a look at the brain injury unit, and they wanted these politicians wanted to speak to a real client. They wanted to speak to someone who had a brain injury. <laughs> So I took them to this particular person and I mentioned that these people were from the Motor Accidents Authority. In, in his insightless manner, he started freaking out because he starts telling them that it wasn't me who caused the accident. Uh, he, it was someone else and he starts talking about confabulating about something completely unrelated to his particular situation. So it is possible that people can incriminate themselves without actually realising. So it is important that we follow guidelines to consent. So that's, that's, that's it, there are the references. What I absolutely recommend, if people haven't done so previously, is going to NCAT. So this is New South Wales based, based there's VCAT in Victoria, and, and it's all pretty similar. NCAT is, uh, so about five years ago, NCAT was, was named. It, it, we used to have a whole lot of different tribunals in New South Wales to deal with different things. So guardianship was one of them, um, arguments across the fence, um, uh, financial disagreements. You would go to various tribunals. <laughs> And I think it was in 2014 that they were all amalgamated under the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, Tribunal. And uh, there are now divisions within NCAT to, to deal with particular things. So what we would be interested in in our situation would be NCAT Guardianship Division. So you can click on, on here. It has terrific documentation. There is a lot of um, there are a lot of fact sheets which are simple to understand. Bearing in mind that a lot of reasons people are going to be going to guardianship is because they they have a, a demented elderly relative, for example. So the fact sheets are simple. They're specific. They give clear guidelines as to what you need to do. And indeed, if you are a medical practitioner and you need to go to guardianship acutely or at a more leisurely pace, there is clear documentation as to what you've got to do. So I'd very much encourage people to go to, to uh, NCAT and explore that. The, the, the important documentation which our presentation has been on today is one of the forms that you can find there and it looks and describes the different treatments. So the urgent treatment, major, minor, special treatment and importantly objecting to non-urgent treatment. So that's uh, the, the form of our particular presentation today. So lastly, the last question, <laughs> has it been helpful? <laughs> and 
So yes, a great deal, a reasonable amount, just a little amount, or no, not at all. <coughs> Excellent. A few more people. Don't be embarrassed, I won't be offended. 10, good. We got up to 13, I think, at one stage, so, right. Good. All right, still 11, still 12. 13 is 13th person. No, we can't get the 13th. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what um, I've got to be able to somehow do is, is find out who gave the best responses. And so I think if you, oh, in fact, I think if I click on to the next question, okay. So I'm going to close the quiz and do that. So keep your phones open. And somehow I can, so quiz results. Now, if people, in fact, I wonder if people can put their, if you want to put your name, you can just put a name in, I think. <laughs> Are you mad? <laughs> What's that? I had. Are you mad? Or put our names in on those responses? No, no, you can just no, you can just you can just identify. Say, well, look, someone someone got eight. Someone, I mean, that's eight out of ten. That's pretty. Well, eight out of nine, actually, because one of them wasn't um, wasn't a, a score. So eight. Someone someone someone's potentially going to get a nice prize here. But you have to, you have to be brave. You have to be brave. No one, no one. Someone came second. I don't know who Spotlight is. Spotlight. Does anyone want to own up to being Spotlight? Although they can't be, they can't be first, second, and third. They, they might have been my trial questions that I put in. Perhaps. Someone got six. That's not bad. A couple of people got six. No, no one wants to win the prize. Oh, it was you. <laughs> thank you for attending, and uh, and and thanks for participating in that. That went all right. All the best. Any questions? We seem to be, I guess, more fussing with patients that doesn't give consent, and then start worrying about their capacity. That if they agree with us, that we're kind of suspicious that we don't have. Yep. So absolutely, that's that's one of the issues that I'd raised. That it, there's a duty of care. So a doctor, whenever we see someone, it is important that we are implicitly assessing their competency. We we, we probably come to the appointment initially that the person is competent, but as we're talking to them, if we have concerns that they are incompetent to make the decisions that we might be asking of them then it is our duty of care to assess whether that person is incompetent or competent, as the case may be, because if they are incompetent, then we shouldn't be listening to their advice. We should be getting some, we should be following the, the guidelines that NCAT have provided, and that may involve going to NCAT, especially if the person is refusing treatment that we think would be worthwhile. So absolutely, you, you need to assess the competency of someone and and not just sit back and say, yeah, look, if I don't want to organise a, a, a script for them or I don't want to organise that operation because that'll take that'll take forever. And the person said they don't really want it anyway. So that's that's easy. I, I'm, you know, you can't do that. You can't just uh, you, you can't just take the easy route if and accept the person as being competent when they're not. Um, I might have got the question wrong, but uh, there was a question about the patient having psychotic symptoms. Yeah. So in that case, why you can't schedule the patient on the mental health act? Because you can still based on yep. organic. You know, Absolutely, you can. So that, that is another area of, of legislation that you could go down. And um, so that absolutely that is that is legitimate. But there are many examples where you want to prescribe an antipsychotic where the person, uh, you know, 
so forth. It's yep. it's, so definitely you could be scheduling the person. But then you have to present them. So I do mention this stuff. You do? Yep. Yep. The guardianship tribunal uh, or, or NCAT <coughs> is something as rehab physicians you will absolutely come across. Um, if you if you don't come across it at some point, it's it's because you potentially you're accepting incompetent people's decisions when you perhaps shouldn't be, when you shouldn't be, not perhaps. So you will come across it. You may not physically go to an NCAT tribunal hearing and present information, but absolutely that happens. Uh, I've certainly been to a few in my time. So uh, with an aging population and a, a more, um, uh, a, a population where incompetence is going to be a frequent occurrence, I am sure you're going to come across this. So I would very much advise that people understand the, the basics of NCAT. And it's pretty easy to follow fact sheets and that sort of thing. So thank you, I'll leave it at that. Oh, two o'clock, right on. <coughs> thank you. So uh, before I introduce the next speaker, just a reminder that next uh, next month it will be at a different location again. So check your email um, or you'll probably go to the wrong place. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Paul Lai, who's a psychiatry registrar from Royal North Shore Hospital. Um, Royal North Shore Hospital provides a consultation service for the brain injury unit at Royal Rehab. Um, if any of you have worked in uh, brain injury before, you will know how important um, having a psychiatry service is for brain injury. And there's a lot of psychiatry in rehabilitation more generally. So thank you, Paul, for your time. Thank you. Gosh. How do you think? Um, <coughs> sorry. Do you want to use your own laptop? Yeah. yeah. This one. So first, um, I'll get you to connect to the Wi-Fi. Oh, why don't we just, I can just get set up. It's easy. Since it just gone this, or? No, you should just go to this. You can progress the slides and things. Yes. And uh, there's no show. Uh, the car change and and uh, RACP when I get that one. <laughs> Is it your sound in your presentation? No, no sounds. It's a size of your for the meantime, um, my client's just going to get a kick off. You have to go left and right on the. Oh, okay, I could just yeah. use that. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Cool. Um, why don't we start? Okay. okay. All right, uh, my name is Paul and today's topic is on psychiatry and traumatic brain injury or short form is uh, TBI. Uh, this is Muhammad Ali and who throughout his boxing career caused a lot of uh, traumatic brain injury. He won 56 fights uh, and 36 of which were knockouts and this is a picture of him um, fighting uh, Sonny Liston in May of 1965. Um, uh, it lasted a total of one round. So a little bit about myself, um, I am currently in my second year of psychiatry training and doing the consultation liaison psychiatry role for Royal North Shore Hospital. As part of the role, I go out to Royal Rehab uh, out at Putney um, uh, to uh, visit the, the brain injury and spinal injury units there. Um, this is a picture of the Royal Rehab Hospital and as part of our service we uh, go and provide um, uh, uh, patients in a general type hospital setting with uh, comorbid mental health issues and provide support and advice. Uh, just a few acknowledgements about today's presentation. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ralph Ilshef as well as Dr. Clayton King for letting me use a few of their slides that they've kind of developed for their previous talks on this topic before. So today we'll talk about um, what traumatic brain injury is, uh, the symptoms uh, they can cause, um, psychiatric conditions that are commonly seen in people with uh, traumatic brain injury and how these symptoms can kind of sometimes uh, overlap and are sometimes difficult to differentiate between kind of psychiatric conditions um, and the treatments that are available for psychiatric comorbidity. Um, yeah. So some quick revision, um, as we know our brain uh, is subdivided into different areas and this is a very simplistic representation of the different uh, parts of the brain. Um, you've got your frontal lobes that are involved in terms of thinking, memory, behaviour and movement. You've got your uh, parietal lobe that helps in terms of um, language and touch and occipital lobes for things like sight, um, temporal lobe for hearing, learning and feelings, cerebellum for balance and coordination, your brain stem um, that uh, helps in terms of regulating breathing, heart rate and temperature. Now, of course, it's a very simplistic version of, uh, of the brain, and this is a more kind of deconstructed version with more kind of subdivisions as well as how the brain kind of interlinks with each other um, in terms of um, um, your high order functions like planning, um, motivation, judgment, insight, and uh, memory. So depending on like, what mode of injury you get and the areas that are affected, um, you get different kind of symptoms of your brain injury. Um, so then uh, what is traumatic brain injury? In simplistic terms, traumatic brain injury is uh, damage uh, to the brain caused by sudden trauma to the head, um, or usually by a kind of external force. Um, uh, so for example, someone hitting you in the head or having a motor vehicle accident when your head hits an uh, hits, um, outside object. Um, so it's not something that you can kind of, um, you're kind of born with, it's not something that's kind of congenital or degenerative. Um, so it's not something um, that you get with a kind of general medical condition like dementia and kind of a degeneration in that sense. And it may or may not include a, uh, a period of loss of consciousness. There are some other terms that are usually used in the literature, um, like acquired brain injury, um, slightly different to traumatic brain injury in that it's a more of a kind of umbrella term that includes traumatic brain injury. And it covers for things uh, where people get injuries from things like hypoxia, um, due to drug overdoses or near drownings. It covers for things like people with medical conditions where they get a, a multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's disease or damage caused by infection or cerebrovascular disease. So quite brain injury is a bigger kind of umbrella term. And then you have your more general term of head injury, which encompasses all head injuries, whether you have brain injury or not. Um, traumatic brain injury can be further kind of um, classified into open or closed injuries. 
um, open injury or penetrating type traumatic brain injuries tends to involve a break in the skull um, and that's the key in terms of the differences in the two. Um, so often uh, penetrating or, or open uh, traumatic brain injury is caused by foreign objects like bullets or shrapnels and the, the pattern of injury depends on which areas of the brain are affected. Um, when looking at uh, more closed um, uh, tra traumatic brain injury, they're more kind of uh, diffuse type injuries. It doesn't involve a break in the skull and they're more from incidences where you have a car accident, you hit an airbag, you hit a dashboard, you hit the windscreen, or the other common scenario is um, someone having, having uh, um, some alcohol and they're falling over the top pub, hitting their head. Um, but of course, um, these are kind of very limited uh, type of uh, scenarios and obviously the, the circumstances surrounding traumatic brain injury are, are very wide and varied. Um, it can also be kind of uh, classified in terms of its severity, whether it be mild, moderate or severe, which we'll go through later. Um, and of course, uh, uh, because uh, um, um, in the field of psychiatry we have our DSM, our Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, so we've got a whole different definition. <laughs> so we'll go through that now. Um, so under the DSM, uh, traumatic brain injury um, and its symptoms kind of come under two broad categories. And these are neurocognitive disorders and personality disorders. And furthermore, it's kind of classified under major or mild neurocognitive disorder. And there are further differentiations, um, whether it be a mild or major neurocognitive disorder with um, traumatic brain injury specifically. In terms of the personality disorders, it comes under the subheading of other personality disorders. Um, and then there's a subheading under that called personality change due to another medical condition. That's where you insert your traumatic brain injury. So it does, in the personality side of things, it doesn't spe specify traumatic brain injury, whereas in the neurocognitive disorders, it does. Um, so when you look at the criteria for major neurocognitive disorder, um, you have to have kind of evidence of significant cognitive decline from a previous level of performance in one or more cognitive domains. And these include complex attention, executive function, learning and memory, language, perceptual motor and social cognition. And this evidence can be either reported from the individual themselves, or it can be reported by a close family member, someone who knows it very well, um, someone who's a friend um, or a clinician, or it can be based on kind of uh, objective uh, clinical assessments from uh, different tools that we use. Um, there has to be some cognitive deficits in the major criteria. Um, you've got to have uh, deficits that interfere with independent uh, daily living. And the, the criteria they use is things such as paying your bills or managing your own medications. And uh, in the DSM, we, there's all these uh, kind of common caveats uh, where these symptoms can't be a part of a kind of delirium type process and they can't be part of another kind of uh, mental disorder. Furthermore, with the major neurocognitive disorder, you can either specify which, uh, which condition causing the neurocognitive disorder. So in the DSM, there's a complete uh, list and I've got it here. And uh, traumatic brain injury is one of the, the criteria that we can use. But there's other things like Alzheimer's, Lewy body, um, but today specifically, I think we're uh, concerned with traumatic brain injury. Um, in terms of their classification in the definition, you can specify whether they have or have not got any behavioural disturbance. And uh, again, you can specify the severity, mild, moderate or severe. In the mild cognitive disorders, um, uh, the difference is that it's a more modest uh, cognitive decline rather than a significant one. And uh, the cognitive deficits, um, they don't interfere with independent living. Um, independent uh, daily activities such as paying bills or managing medications. However, they can have some deficits, but with kind of um, um, support, they can perform these functions and that's still classified under the kind of mild uh, criteria. Um, then moving on to the, um, the sp uh, specific traumatic brain injury criteria. So they need to meet the criteria for either major or mild as previously defined. Um, and there has to be evidence of tra trauma to the head. Um, and here it, it talks about um, whether it be from a kind of a, um, external force or mechanisms that um, involve a rapid movement or displacement of the brain within the skull. Um, here they're kind of referring to more whiplash type injuries where you don't really hit your head, but there's a sudden forward and backwards motions causing injury to the brain. And they have to kind of have one or more of the following criteria, uh, the loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, 
disorientation and confusion, or show some neurological signs. Um, so this can be demonstrated through neuroimaging, um, a new onset of seizures or worsening of a previous seizure disorder, um, previous visual field issues, um, anosmia, uh, which is a loss of sense of smell, and uh, hemiparesis. Um, and these have to kind of, these type of symptoms have to kind of occur immediately after um, the brain injury or once they've kind of returned from consciousness, unconsciousness. In terms of the personality change criteria, um, these are um, um, what they specify in the DSM. Um, there has to be a persistent personality disturbance that uh, represents a change from the individual's kind of previous characteristic uh, personality structure. Um, there has to be some evidence or historical findings that uh, suggest um, a traumatic brain injury um, is causing this. Um, and there has to be, and this, and like I said before, there's the caveats that you can't be explained by a, a delirium type picture and you can't be explained by um, another mental disorder. And these have to kind of um, have significant uh, impacts on, um, on their kind of life in terms of the social, occupational and uh, other important areas uh, for it to be classified as a disorder. Um, so with the personality changes, you can uh, um, specify which type depending on the predominant feature. So labile type, if mood lability is part of the picture, that's kind of like the predominant form, then they, they classified under the labile type. If disinhibition is the main, um, main feature, then it's classified under disinhibitor type and so on. So aggressive, apathetic, paranoid. And then you've got this other kind of overarching uh, um, uh, criteria of other and combined and unspecified. So moving on to the um, severity um, of uh, traumatic brain injury. So it's usually in the literature, it's classified according to uh, these kind of four criteria: um, GCS, loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, and uh, neuroimaging. Um, usually at this initial stage, when you get a traumatic brain injury, um, you can't usually use all these criteria because initially the patient is uh, uh, either knocked out, unconscious, and the, the initial factor is the GCS. Um, and once after they're kind of recovering a bit more, then you can kind of incorporate the other factors like loss of consciousness and uh, the PTA testing. I think most of you guys would be uh, well versed, or not really. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the, the post-traumatic amnesia is is the period after they return from consciousness, and often there's a, um, a difficulties in terms of developing new memories. Um, and there's uh, several tests you can do on a kind of daily basis to help them. Uh, um, see when that recovery is. And it's important because it uh, impacts on prognosis. Um, so some of the symptoms uh, um, after traumatic brain injury, there may or may not be a uh, impairment of consciousness. Uh, it can be short or prolonged. Um, and after consciousness re and consciousness returns, ah, uh, consciousness returns, um, the period of, uh, there's a period of post-traumatic delirium, amnesia and agitation. And in the long term, there's this thing called a post concussive syndrome, which we'll go through. And uh, there's um, two prominent uh, frontal lobe syndromes described. Um, so the post concussive syndrome can be broken up into several categories in terms of their symptoms, um, sensory and somatic symptoms, which include headache, blurred vision, dizziness, uh, sleep problems, um, neurobehavioral and cognitive complaints. Um, so subjective memory problems, difficulties in terms of concentration, uh, slowed information processing and other cognitive difficulties and neuropsychiatric complaints uh, related to emotional issues such as irritability, depression, anxiety. And this occurs uh, uh, more predominantly in your kind of mild to moderate uh, type of cases. Um, more severe forms, uh, you might get a frontal lobe injury. And in the literature, it describes two prominent uh, um, scenarios. One um, is related to kind of damage to the orbitofrontal areas. And uh, Leachman's organic psychiatry described the syndrome where it's more of a, uh, describes it as a pseudo-psychotic type syndrome or a syndrome where there's kind of excess of kind of emotions, activities and behaviours. So there's significant increase in impulsivity uh, significant disinhibition, hyperactivity, distractibility, and mood liability in the syndrome. The other one is 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 quite opposite, uh, um, and it's one where it's uh, described in in Leishman as a um, 
um, amotivation type syndrome, one that's uh, kind of like a pseudo depression that's the prominent features are apathy, um, which is a lack of affect or motivation. A kind of old term called abulia, uh, which is slightly different to, to a lack of motivation. It's more of a, a lack of will and has to be uh, uh, due to cerebral disease. Um, and uh, in terms of its less severe forms of abulia, you get slowness, you get chronic speech, delayed responses, and decreased initiative and effort. Um, in terms of the more severe forms of abulia, you get a ikinetic uh, uh, mutism where there's a reduce in terms of movement as well as a uh, reduce in terms of speech. So of course all these symptoms then kind of uh, impact on the person's capacity to kind of self-care for themselves. There's always changes in relationships and changes in roles, um, difficulties with further employment or usual employment. Um, and difficulties in terms of their social engagement and uh, other interests uh, such as hobbies. So then what, what, what kind of things cause these uh, type of problems? Um, um, uh, I've got them here. Um, so contusions are kind of bruises uh, to the brain uh, caused by um, injury and there's uh, two forms uh, briefly described, um, described as Q injuries and contra Q injuries. A Q injury occurs um, now at the site, uh, close to the site of injury and a contracute injury occurs on the other side, contralateral side. And then there's this, um, this thing called diffuse axonal injury, which is a kind of stretching and uh, tearing of the neurons um, in the brain as a result of the injury. And often involves a, a kind of a, a acceleration and deceleration type injury where you're going very fast and then you stop um, very quickly um, and causes the brain to kind of move around. Um, it causes a kind of degeneration of the neuron, um, a reabsorption of the myelin, and you see this kind of classic design on MRI um, um, where they describe it as a kind of retraction ball. So um, you can see that here. Um, the thing with diffuse axonal injury is that even though if you can't find anything on a kind of imaging type slide, um, or if you can't find anything on injury on, on imaging, it doesn't mean that they uh, don't have a diffuse axonal injury. Um, uh, uh, so that's, yeah, uh, yeah, so if you find it, uh, it means it's there. If you don't find it, it may or may not be there. And there's obviously your vascular lesion, cerebral edema, and cerebral anoxia, which is a uh, lack of oxygen to the brain after uh, injury. So this, there's this uh, study from uh, 1937 done by um, Corville, um, which I think is still kind of applicable today. Um, so he, it was back in 1937, there was limitations in terms of uh, technology. And what he did was he studied a series of 50 uh, people who had died from closed uh, brain injury, uh, closed traumatic brain injury. And he kind of drew the, um, uh, the sites of contusion um, overlapping each other. And after 50 brains, this is uh, kind of the pictures that he got from it. So as you can see, there are kind of characteristic areas where um, the brains are affected by contusions. Um, or common areas where uh, closed uh, traumatic head injury, traumatic brain injury um, occurs. And it's predominantly in the kind of frontal areas and temporal areas here. The other kind of areas are relatively spared. So then in correlation to, uh, to the areas that are impacted, uh, as you can see, um, there are different functions that are affected, including executive function, um, areas of attention, sustained attention, femoral retrieval issues, um, issues in terms of judgment and insight, um, problem solving problems, um, emotional and social behavior, um, issues of arousal, um, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this is another representation of it, um, and it's in relation to the two kind of uh, frontal syndromes we described earlier. Um, so then uh, moving on to uh, psychiatry and traumatic brain injury. So often, as I said before, um, the psychiatric symptoms are often very difficult to differentiate between kind of brain injury type symptoms. And uh, in the literature, um, in terms of the studies that are involved, um, there's this general agreement that uh, traumatic brain injury causes a, um, increases your risk of developing uh, psychiatric conditions. However, in the, the numbers and percentage wise uh, are very varied. Um, and this is related to um, different uh, research being done on, on different areas and, and uh, limited population. Um, so so um, uh, when you look at the systemic reviews, um, there's about 10 to 80% of people that can develop a neuropsychiatric disorder. 
Um, most people will have a cognitive deficit. Um, they'll have issues in terms of major depression. Um, they'll develop uh, things like anxiety disorders. And there's a small percentage of people that develop a mania and a psychosis after traumatic brain injury. And uh, if we've got time, we'll go through some of the cognitive behaviour concerns in traumatic brain injury, so sort of substance use issues. Often there is a kind of pre-morbid uh, substance use issue that uh, continues on or is exacerbated after injury. And overall, um, putting aside um, all these factors, people who experience a traumatic brain injury are at increased risk compared to the general population um, of committing suicide. Um, so then complicating all these difficulties in terms of differentiating the factors, there are all these kind of social and um, uh, unmedical issues, if you can put it that way. Um, things like uh, litigation um, can affect uh, symptoms uh, dramatically. Um, and there are two kind of uh, uh, schools of thought on that. One is one the, of um, uh, beneficial gain or secondary gain. And the other school of thought is um, that uh, there are significant psychological distresses involved in things like court cases and, and that the psychological distress involved with that um, exacerbates their symptoms and we tend to kind of err on the, the second interpretation. Um, often in, the, in uh, mild traumatic brain injury cases, a uh, rapid resolution of the kind of um, uh, rapid resolution of the court case um, helps in terms of resolution of symptoms as well. Uh, the characteristics of the injury is important in the circumstances surrounding it, um, whether it be the person was kind of under significant emotional distress at the time from their work, from their relationship or from their family, or whether um, uh, what happened during the injury was a kind of suicide attempt, whether the person was in a psychotic episode and things like that to get the traumatic brain injury. Um, and also, as we know, there are kind of medical comorbidities and then medications on top of that, which produces side effects and, and all those things that complicate things. Expectations from the family as well as the patient in terms of recovery is also important in outcome in terms of psychiatric illness and uh, whether there is kind of adequate social support place, put in place. In terms of kind of treatment for these kind of disorders, um, uh, first line treatment should always be uh, non-pharmacological type treatments. Um, this is a study, this is a recent uh, systemic review that they did in France uh, about uh, uh, psychological and behaviour issues with um, traumatic brain injury. And uh, they had a look at kind of all the evidence available for kind of like the kind of non-pharmacological treatments in terms of brain injury. Um, and the general, and, and as well as kind of um, talk, uh, they got a, f a lot of the experts in the field um, to give expert opinions about management in this regard. Um, when you look at the kind of evidence in terms of like RCTs and things like that, it's quite very limited in terms of research into these non-pharmacological treatments. But uh, with the systemic review, um, the general consensus from the expert opinion was that these were kind of uh, beneficial and should be used as first line. So they provided kind of several um, recommendations um, uh, that emphasise the importance of trying to minimise pharmacological treatments as much as we can, um, because as we know, a lot of the medications, especially in the psychiatric field, have significant side effects and they impact on, on things like memory as well, um, it impacts things like motivation and, uh, and recall um, and things like that. Um, so then they proposed like several different types of approaches like interpersonal, holistic, cognitive behavioural approaches, systems approaches and psychodynamic. In the interpersonal approach, they emphasise the importance in terms of developing the relationship uh, with the patient, um, whether it be from the treating team, um, whether it be from friends and family, because often there is kind of like a change after the injury and uh, we can't always function the way we functioned before. Um, and often it's important to uh, provide education on, uh, for family about that. Um, and the impacts that uh, this will have. And that gives them a kind of better opportunity to kind of change their behaviours as well to kind of accommodate the patient so that we reduce the kind of amounts of um, um, incidences where uh, the patient becomes very agitated, very angry and very uh, behaviourally disturbed. Um, the cognitive behaviour approach we'll uh, discuss about later. And uh, systemic approaches um, in terms of um, 
so each kind of family, each kind of culture has got their own kind of systems and it's important to kind of uh, work out the interplay between that um, and the health system and any, anything we can do to kind of minimise the, 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 the boundaries and the, and the difficulties in that is also helpful. Um, in terms of uh, psychodynamic uh, uh, longer term type therapy, there is, uh, there is a kind of place for it, but uh, not in the kind of immediate, uh, immediate terms uh, after injury. Um, so when you look at uh, cognitive deficits, uh, so things like fatigue, decreased arousal, abolition, uh, bullying, and apathy, um, when looking at the literature, there are some literatures that, that suggest that there may be some benefits in terms of the use of amantadine, um, which is initially an antiviral, then was an anti-Parkinson's drug, in terms of kind of uh, decreasing the amount of fatigue and decreasing the amount of apathy and abolition. Um, but when you look at all the studies together, they, they kind of uh, seem very limited. It's done on kind of minimal amounts of patient. It doesn't reach kind of statistical significance. Um, as well as things like stimulants, um, which uh, uh, in some limited studies show some improvements. Um, uh, however, um, uh, they don't reach kind of statistical significance. So, so I think the, um, it's, um, although um, some studies show that there is some benefit, it, it's not uh, really um, kind of like a full recommendation as of yet because there hasn't been kind of full studies done for that. All right, so moving on to uh, major depressive disorder. Um, so this is the definition from the DSM. Um, major depressive disorder is characterized by depressed mood or anhedonia, which is a loss of pleasure in uh, usual activities. And this has to be uh, over a period of at least two weeks. Um, so it's depressed mood or anhedonia. And then you've got to kind of uh, fulfill uh, five or more of these kind of uh, um, criteria as well, um, depressed mood and anhedonia included um, in the five. Um, so you have to see if there's um, any significant unintentional weight loss or weight gain. Uh, often with depressed mood, there's uh, changes in appetite. Um, see if there's any kind of sleep disturbance, whether it be uh, poor sleep at night or, or lots of sleep during the daytime. Um, any psychomotor agitation or retardation. Any fatigue, tightness or low energy levels. Uh, feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness, concentration difficulties, and recurrent thoughts of death and suicide. So as you can see with the list here, a few of the symptoms can overlap with the um, uh, traumatic brain injury. So things like uh, psychomotor retardation, the fatigue, the tiredness, um, and the low energy levels, um, depressed mood. Um, but the thing here that um, you probably won't see in uh, kind of a traumatic brain injury is the sense of worthlessness, the excessive guilt, and the recurrent thoughts of death and suicide. So usually those two are the kind of red flags. So, the, so some people have the injury, it's naturally kind of feel depressed, but they're feeling so depressed to the point where they're very hopeless or they're very um, feeling feelings of guilt and worthlessness and wanting to die all the time, then those are the type of themes that suggest more of a kind of depressive episode rather than just an um, array of symptoms from the brain injury. Now, the most uh, recent studies about uh, major depressive disorder suggest about a quarter prevalence for people with traumatic brain injury. That's about one in four. Um, however, when you look at all the literature, it ranges from six to 77 percent, uh, which is it's quite a big range. Um, but overall, there is a kind of a consensus that there is an increased uh, uh, risk of developing major depressive disorder, and uh, strongly about 7.5 times uh, compared to the general population. Um, and uh, usually it's, uh, in terms of developing the disorder, it's highest in the, the first year of injury. Um, but the, in terms of the increased risk, it remains over subsequent years. And uh, obviously, uh, if you have a major depressive disorder, there's significant impacts in terms of uh, prognosis and function, uh, if not treated. In terms of the treatments for uh, major depressive disorder, um, so, um, as we go, um, we like to try and avoid kind of a psycho uh, pharmacological management. Um, so the first line, um, so some of the things you can do is uh, psychotherapy, including CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, IPT, uh, interpersonal therapy and supportive therapy. Um, and these will kind of help with people kind of adjust to the, 
the, the injury and the current situation. Um, it also help in terms of uh, replacing kind of negative behaviours or negative beliefs about themselves with more healthy and more positive ones. Um, it will help in terms of exploring relationship difficulties, um, help them to kind of develop a more uh, positive interaction with their close loved ones and other people. Um, and regain a kind of sense of satisfaction with themselves and help them to kind of have uh, more of a control of their life. Um, uh, the psychological therapies over time will also help with a uh, sense of hopelessness as well as anger um, and uh, setting realistic goals uh, moving forward in the future. Um, so just a, a caution in terms of um, when we're about to prescribe medications in terms of treating depression. Um, uh, so I've got a box of kind of... Uh, recommendations um, uh, in the American Press um, textbook uh, to start low and uh, go slow, do kind of one medication change at a time. Um, and that kind of makes sense because you want to know that what you're prescribing is actually working if you give them two or three things at once. If it works, you're kind of just kind of wondering what works. Uh, if, you, if it kind of uh, doesn't work, you're not sure whether it's the side effects of one medication causing the symptoms. Um, don't be reactionary, so kind of see a patient over a period of time um, to ensure that uh, it is a kind of major depressive disorder because if it's not, then whether you treat it or not, <laughs> um, it's not going to make... So if it's not a major depressive disorder and you, treat, you give them an antidepressant, it's not really going to be helpful for them. Um, and you've uh, got to be careful of benzodiazepines because in a traumatic brain injury, um, the brain is kind of... Um, often uh, trying to recover there's issues in terms of memories and we don't want to kind of make that worse. Um, we've got to choose medications that are likely to um, um, that help uh, that don't reduce the seizure threshold because people with traumatic brain injury have an increased risk of uh, developing kind of seizures. Um, and we've got to try and minimise the kind of extra perennial side effects um, and anticholinergic effects as it impacts in terms of uh, uh, brain recovery. Um, We've got to be careful of kind of potential drug interactions and uh, look, if, if, if you try a treatment and it's kind of not working and uh, um, don't keep going, <laughs> um, wean it off slowly and uh, try something else. Um, in terms of fulfilling this criteria and in terms of reduced anticholinergic effects and, and the other effects, um, the serotonin, selected serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs are usually the first line. Um, and kind of your best bet in terms of getting a response. Um, so these include the fluoxetine, sertraline and citalopram. Um, obviously um, with uh, major depressive disorder, it's no different than um, uh, whether someone has traumatic brain injury or not. Um, if there are kind of significant risks in terms of uh, suicide, significant risk in terms of their developing a kind of psychotic depression and they need to kind of psychiatric care, um, then the, there's no kind of contraindication for them to kind of come into a mental health facility provide that's required. Um, but obviously, uh, in terms of their benefit, uh, we would like to try and manage them on the, on the ward that they've been in. And if needed in severe cases, um, um, we can give them uh, electroconvulsive therapy as well, which is ECT. Um, so the, these, um, so the point uh, here is that those kind of traumatic brain injury, those are not, not kind of contraindicated if needed. Uh, moving on to anxiety disorders. Um, so people, oh, yes. How are you pushing against depressants? So usually with the antidepressants, we like to start on a kind of introductory dose. Um, so usually um, we give a trial dose for about one week or two weeks. Sometimes you get a kind of response from a kind of placebo type response. Um, and, and, and the main thing there is to, because these medications have side effects, you can get nausea, you can get headaches. If you start on the kind of treatment dose, um, they'll get the side effects and they won't like it and they won't take it. Um, and these take, um, often take a long time for it to kind of work. Um, so usually we start, we start a low dose and then after a week, if they're kind of tolerating it, you can kind of increase it bit further to the treatment dose. Um, usually too for its full effects um, or for an effect to be seen is about four to six weeks. Um, but in terms of side effects, you kind of see them straight away. Um, so things like um, uh, 
So if you get side effects, you see them straight away, but in terms of impacts on improving the mood, you can take up to kind of six weeks to six months for its kind of full effects. Mm -hmm. But say after about four weeks, it's not really working, it's not unreasonable to kind of stop and, mm -hmm. and change to a different one. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone on the medication, they improve, yes. how often do you consider to bring that medication off? And do you then consider to stop it? Ah. So if, say, you start on a low dose and uh, you get an immediate response, uh, the likelihood that it's <laughs> from the medication, it's more of a kind of homeopathic type or placebo type response to it. If there's benefit from the patient, if they feel that it's beneficial for them to take it, then usually we'll continue it. If obviously there are significant side effects and the patient wishes to kind of come off the medication, um, then we'll stop it. If it's beneficial, generally um, you can continue for a period of uh, six months at least. Um, have a regular review of a psychiatrist uh, um, to review that and um, whether they can stop it early or not. Generally when we're stopping these type of things, we've got to go a bit slow, uh, but depending on which medication, there's different specific criteria. So, yeah. hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, anxiety disorders. Um, so again, there's kind of like a wide range um, in terms of uh, the impacts on traumatic brain injury and developing an anxiety disorder. Um, uh, uh, so Rogers et al. Uh, describes about a quarter prevalence, um, which is about a, a kind of 2.3 fold increase compared to the general population. Um, they're also kind of uh, specific phobic disorders depending on the, the mode of injury. Um, so if it was kind of like a motor vehicle accident, um, uh, a lot of people will have, uh, about 20% of people will have a, a kind of fear of uh, traveling um, in a car and, and things like that. Um, there's also, um, they can develop an agoraphobia, uh, which is kind of like a marked fear or anxiety into the following. Um, so they might have issues in terms of using kind of public transport, um, be worried about kind of open spaces, uh, being in the closed spaces, uh, standing in line, being in the crowd, or just being outside of the home by themselves. Um, so um, they can develop some of these type of disorders. In terms of the treatment for anxiety disorders, there's no difference uh, whether you have a traumatic brain injury or not. Um, uh, it's treatment as per usual guidelines of, uh, um, of psychiatry. And the psychological therapies that have been shown in terms of evidence-based medicine are CBT, behaviour therapy, and you can get these forms in terms of e-therapies. Um, so you can do CBT and behaviour therapy kind of online um, nowadays. Uh, CBT is cognitive behaviour therapy, so we tend to kind of work with thoughts um, and behaviours. There's often... Um, patients who have a thought and which lead to a kind of negative behavior. If you get them to kind of identify that thought, then they can change that thought and then in turn change their behavior. Um, behavior therapy is similar to uh, cognitive behavior therapy, except it's involving only behaviors. It doesn't involve any of the work on the thoughts. Um, so it's more um, what they call kind of graded exposure. So if you're kind of worried about, uh, or you have this fear about doing something, you kind of slowly work up towards it. You do kind of a, um, a, a slight exposure to it um, before you kind of do the whole thing. Um, yeah. Um, and obviously uh, you can also, um, there is also um, uh, SSRIs as we discussed before. Usually SSRIs you use at a kind of lower dose um, in terms of treating the anxiety and small treating kind of background type anxiety rather than uh, the acute um, episodes. Um, as we mentioned before, in uh, traumatic brain injury, you try to avoid uh, benzodiazepines. And even in usual treatment anxiety disorders, benzodiazepines are only used uh, for the short term um, uh, and uh, we try to use more short acting ones. So then there is, um, they can also develop a post traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Um, and typically these symptoms have to last for at least a month. Um, the person has to be kind of exposed to an event um, where there has been a death. Um, so witnessing a death of a um, close family member or uh, seeing a friend die. Um, there has to be an occasion um, of threatened death or actual threatened serious injury. So they have to have at least one of these criteria involved um, before that. They can be kind of 
um, meets the criteria for post-traumatic stress. And also they need to have the uh, experience the kind of traumatic event uh, persistently. So it's a kind of re bring it up every time you see them or um, having flashbacks and, and things like that. Um, there has to be a kind of uh, behavior where there's avoidance of trauma related stimuli um, after the trauma. Um, and there has to be kind of associated uh, negative thoughts or feelings that begin um, after they had the incident. Um, it can also be kind of a trauma related arousal or, or reactivity. So sometimes it's kind of just uh, sitting there and kind of, uh, they're kind of more hyper arousal, more sensitive to particular events. So str strangely enough, um, um, uh, PTSD in the more severe and moderate uh, traumatic brain injury is less likely um, compared to your mild uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. And they think that this is uh, related to the memory of the event. However, people with kind of more severe, more moderate uh, traumatic brain injury can also have PTSD from family members or people telling them about the incident and how horrific it was. Um, it's more common when there is kind of an acute stress reaction involved. Um, and uh, there is a study that suggests that if you get CBT earlier on, and you can kind of prevent PTSD. Um, acute stress reaction is, is uh, kind of an acute reaction to the trauma, uh, uh, significant fears of dying and getting very anxious and requiring medications to manage. Um, and obviously the, uh, with post-traumatic stress in terms of uh, things like attention, there are kind of some evidence, uh, some uh, overlap in terms of symptoms. The main state of treatments for post-traumatic stress are psychological, um, cognitive behavior therapy again, relaxation therapy, um, usually a resolution of kind of litigation processes is uh, important because often when you go to court, you kind of re-experience the, the trauma and the events that happen. Um, so in a small, in a minor population, uh, patients can develop a mania or a psychosis after TBI. Um, but the studies are kind of very limited, uh, kind of limited to kind of case reports of mania. Um, but often uh, in terms of the symptoms of psychosis and mania, it's difficult to kind of differentiate from the kind of post-traumatic delirium that uh, people can develop after the injury or immediately after the injury. And as you can see, the symptoms include kind of agitation, irritability, distractibility, and sexual disinhibition. If it's part of kind of like the um, uh, delirium process, these kind of symptoms will kind of gradually resolve over time. Whereas if it's more part of a kind of psychotic episode, and can last for uh, a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of um, treatment, you, the usual treatment for mania um, is the gold standard is lithium. However, in traumatic brain injury, because it exacerbates confusion and can cause ataxia, uh, we tend not to use lithium. And the mainstay when someone has a kind of traumatic brain injury uh, would be sodium valparate, um, is the preferred new stabiliser. There may or may not be a need to use uh, antipsychotics um, in terms of treatment. Um, uh, just a quick note on anticonvulsants. Um, uh, so things like uh, Kepra, which I think is quite popular um, with uh, uh, the neurologists. Um, uh, it can um, cause kind of uh, what they call psychiatric adverse events. So things like a depression, anxiety, and even psychosis. Um, it's not to say not to use it, but just uh, as a consideration if someone is kind of severely depressed, um, whether it might be due to um, the medication that's causing the depression or not as a kind of consideration to use. Um, uh, the medications that are kind of, um, uh, that have the least risk of causing these psychiatric adverse events, are kind of phenytoin, valparate, carbamazepine and lamotrigine. Um, but they, they can also kind of cause them as well, but at a kind of lower rate. Uh, uh, you guys all know what psychosis is? <laughs> um, so, um, okay. Uh, obviously, uh, psychosis, you can kind of develop um, uh, via different types of mechanisms. Um, as you know, after seizure, there's, there's, um, you can uh, develop a post, uh, post ictal um, psychosis. Um, uh, it can be a result of their kind of cognitive impairment or can be a result of their kind of neurological damage that they've got. Um, so if someone is defined as being psychotic or in a state of psychosis, there's the presence of two or more of the following. 
uh, delusions, hallucinations, uh, disorganized speech, um, or grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. Um, usually if there is kind of visual type hallucinations, it's uh, less likely that it's kind of a kind of um, psychiatric cause for the psychosis. And more often it's more of an organic cause like a delirium. Yeah. You see those okay? Yeah. So these are the different pathways, different dopamine pathways before we get into antipsychotics. And there are kind of four pathways involved. Um, and these are the, there's the mesolimbic pathway, the mesocortical pathway, nigrostriatal pathway, and the um, tubular fundibular pathway. And these have kind of a, uh, different effects when we give the um, antipsychotics um, on these different uh, pathways. Um, the nigrostriatal pathway is usually responsible for your kind of extrapyramidal side effects of the dystonia, the, um, the, if they describe a kind of internal agitation or internal restlessness, um, akathisia. Um, if they kind of describe, um, if they get uh, what's called a kind of tardive dyskinesia, which is kind of involuntary muscle movements, um, and this is kind of the pathway that's kind of implicated. Um, there's also the uh, tubio, tubero infundibular pathway, uh, which is responsible for um, uh, your high prolactin levels um, after antipsychotic is given. Um, and uh, in schizophrenia, they talk about uh, positive symptoms of schizophrenia and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are like your auditory hallucinations, your paranoid delusions, um, and so forth. And the kind of negative symptoms are kind of your lack of motivation, um, your depression, um, uh, slowness in terms of the cognition. Um, the positive symptom pathway involves the mesolimbic pathway and the, um, the lack of activity or the um, uh, negative symptoms involves is involved in the mesocortical pathway. So in terms of antipsychotics, um, there's uh, two main kind of generations. The first antipsychotic was chlorpromazine. Um, it was actually discovered in the 1950s. Um, it wasn't uh, in search of an antipsychotic at the time. Um, they were doing research to try and find a, a new anesthetic agent. Um, but uh, in the trials, um, it showed that, that it showed um, a, a kind of calmness for people um, without much sedation. And uh, they thought that at the time, oh, why don't we uh, try it in terms of seeing if you'll kind of alleviate some of the uh, behaviours in terms of psychiatric patients. It was quite a revolution at the time. Um, it led to, in terms of the treatment, it led to kind of closures of, um, or um, discharges of patients who had been in hospital for quite a long time. Um, and they were kind of suddenly being able to be discharged in the community again. Um, Chlorpromazine does have uh, a lot of uh, anticholinergic effects. Um, which is why in, uh, traumatic brain injury is not uh, very good in terms of um, as its use as an antipsychotic. Um, Haloperidol is the other common antipsychotic that uh, uh, people come across. And uh, usually we use haloperidol as a kind of second line treatment for severe behavior disturbance um, because it's got um, good uh, kind of sedation effects. Um, it's again synthesized in the 1950s. It can be, the positive thing about it is it can be given in kind of oral or IM forms, uh, which is uh, um, why we like it in terms of the distribution is kind of quite predictable about what's going to happen. And because it's, uh, so so the reason why how the protocol was kind of synthesized is they got this kind of chlorpromazine, oh, like, oh my goodness, it's kind of, uh, it led to lots of discharges from hospitals. So why don't we design a medication that's kind of specifically targeting the, the dopamine areas? Um, and uh, so this is a more kind of potent antipsychotic or um, D2 um, antagonist. Um, but because of the, the kind of selective effects it has, there are some significant uh, extra pyramidal side effects. And that's related because you can't really um, have an antipsychotic that treats one part of the brain, it has to treat all the different pathways. So, so because it's of its impacts on the extra pyramidal um, nigrostriatal pathway, you get a lot of uh, kind of extra parental side effects. It can be very kind of uncomfortable for the patient. Mm. 
Oh, uh, it is. Uh, there is um, some uh, kind of uh, uh, antihistamine type properties. Because initially it was a kind of antihistamine, but I'm not not sure about hiccups. <laughs> uh, but I think it's uh, it might be. Yeah. 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 So then, because of um, because of uh, the kind of concerns about extraparietal side effects, um, a new kind of class of antipsychotics were kind of developed, and they're known as the atypical antipsychotics or second generation. Um, and these were um, these have a kind of added mechanism in terms of its action. Um, it acts on uh, serotonin kind of receptors to try and mitigate the. Um, uh, the antagonism of the dope, of the nigrostriatal pathway, and because of this, these uh, serotonergic effects in terms of the extraparietal side effects, these are kind of minimised. But of course, with the second generation antipsychotics, there's significant kind of uh, metabolic concerns. However, compared to um, atypical, uh, compared to typical antipsychotics, they um, they kind of viewed as a kind of better form um, of antipsychotics to use. Um, so it's kind of the common ones are olanzapine, quetiapine and risperidone. Olanzapine is good in terms of that it comes in several different classes. Um, it comes in kind of a wafer form which is absorbed quite quickly. Um, so with our kind of psychotic patients often they lack the insight that they're unwell um, and they need to be kind of treated uh, involuntary. Um, so wafer form provides for quick absorption uh, into the system and uh, immediate effects. Um, <coughs> They do, the lanspine does come in kind of IM formulation as well. Um, and it is uh, used as a kind of rapid sedation agent. However, um, there are concerns, um, uh, there have been kind of reported uh, 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 severe um, incidents after IM lanspine has been given with IM benzodiazepines. So as a recommendation, we don't usually use lanspine and benzodiazepine uh, IM together. Um, and uh, in terms of guidelines, um, usually we try and avoid kind of IM olanzapine because of this confusion and the, uh, the drastic sequelae they can have. Yes, uh, so, so this is why we kind of try and avoid uh, um, IM olanzapine because you kind of get into a kind of tricky situation, what do you kind of use next? Um, so usually um, olanzapine is good in terms of oral form. Um, so you can use the, the orals um, with the benzos and that, that's okay. It's only when you use the IM antipsychotic with the IM benzodiazepine within a period of say two hours or so that we worry. Mm. Yes. Oh, in terms of uh, treatment, yes. Oh, usually, um, usually in, um, in each hospital there is a kind of rapid sedation guidelines, um, and usually the first first line therapy is a kind of short acting benzodiazepine, so something like a lorazepam or a diazepam. Um, but obviously, in, in TBI, you kind of try and avoid benzos, um, and then usually the second line is a kind of antipsychotic, something like a droperidol. Um, yeah. Um, so, quetiapine um, so is, is also um, um, okay, but in terms of its kind of antipsychotic properties, is is quite limited. Um, and uh, in terms of risperidone, um, uh, it's more likely to kind of produce your kind of EPSC uh, extraparietal side effect symptoms. Um, so, I guess uh, so. Usually, um, olanzapine in terms of your orals is is good to get is. Um, is what you use, um, but I don't imagine you guys um, uh, have to kind of rapidly sedate your patients too often, or usually psych will be involved by then. I think it's all the time. Yeah. 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 So yeah, for us. Uh, um, uh, yeah. But if you if you ask different psychiatrists, different psychiatrists will also have different opinions about which uh, um, sedative agent they like to use. Um, but obviously, in that case, kind of like uh, 
um, the safety of staff and safety of the patient is important that's to be taken into consideration and perhaps maybe a benzodiazepine is kind of indicated as well yeah um, usually uh, I am lorazepam is is good because it's short acting um, and there's uh, if they do kind of have a respiratory depression um, the effects of it will, will kind of wear off quite quickly um, Whereas a kind of IM midazolam lasts a bit longer. So there is uh, complications like a respiratory depression. You're kind of stuck with it for a longer period of time. Yeah. Mm. But each hospital will have their own kind of um, uh, sedation guidelines um, that they use. Oh, if anyone's on kind of aripiprazole or clozapine, just give us a call. Don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't, uh, don't uh, venture too much into that. <laughs> um. Uh, how, 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 are go, how are we going? All right, we can read up that. So cognitive behaviour concerns include agitation, aggression, and um, there's some uh, sexual uh, disinhibitor behaviours as well as other sexual concerns, uh, which can lead to kind of uh, um, uh, psychiatric issues. Um, usually the, the uh, agitation is after the period of trauma, and usually it's part of a delirium. So usually they kind of, after a period of time, that it kind of self-resolves. Um, aggression and sexual disorder we'll talk about now. Um, oh yes, I got a bit ahead of myself. Um, so in terms of uh, kind of uh, acute management um, of it, uh, we talked about the, the kind of sedation before. Um, ideally, uh, so ideally we kind of employ those kind of non-pharmacological treatments first so that we don't get to this stage. But um, I know that uh, a lot of times it's great unavoidable as well um, and each hospital has got their own kind of different uh, rapid sedation guidelines um, and, and as long as you guys kind of follow those I think legally you're kind of protected. Um, Anticonvulsants over a longer period of time in terms of treating aggression has been uh, shown to be kind of beneficial in a sense. Um, uh, with antipsychotics there are some studies that show that um, it impacts on kind of neuronal recovery um, so, so those kind of factors have to be kind of weighed up as well in terms of long-term treatment for um, with uh, antipsychotics in terms of aggression. If they obviously if they got a kind of psychotic illness, then antipsychotics are indicated. But if if it's just pure aggression, then uh, um, uh, uh, probably best to, to get a consult uh, before um, prescribing regular antipsychotics. Um, and benzos as talked about before. Um, so there are um, issues in terms of sexual disinhibition um, in the early, usually in the early stages after um, uh, the traumatic injury um, and these also kind of uh, tend to resolve as well um, and uh, uh, some of the studies uh, show uh, kind of frequent behaviors uh, of what uh, sexually inappropriate behavior is uh, that the patients uh, do show uh, some of the most common is uh, kind of in inappropriate uh, talking uh, about uh, sexual topics, um, uh, uh, genital touching and self-exposure. Um, so behaviour strategies that kind of help in terms of sexual uh, disinhibition are things like timeout, um, self-monitoring of their kind of sexual urges, um, as well as kind of scheduled staff feedback. So uh, having a set time where you can kind of feedback to the patient what's been happening and. And uh, apparently uh, dating skill training is also helpful <laughs> um, as for one study. <laughs> um, and sometimes there are, um, you can, uh, uh, if, uh, in, if uh, over a long period of time, um, uh, you might need to consider antipsychotics and there may be a role of anti androgens um, uh, so sexual dysfunction, there is sexual disinhibition and then um, commonly you see sexual dysfunction. Um, in the literature it describes two types of kind of sexual um, types of um, dysfunction. There's the sexual dysfunction in terms of the functioning, in terms of the sexual behaviour itself, and then there's the sexual well-being. Um, they find that uh, most people score quite well in terms of sexual well-being um, and, and it doesn't kind of um, matter in terms of the kind of... Uh, uh, sexual function so they can have a decreased sex life but then still be in terms of the sexual well-being uh, still be very satisfied um, there isn't kind of any kind of specific uh, questionnaires that people use 
um, except for this one uh, specific for traumatic brain injury. So you've got your kind of general ones, but this one has been kind of developed uh, that's specific for uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, uh, keep going or stop or uh, a few guys. Uh, it's almost finished. I've got to, uh, so obviously uh, there's the issue of uh, substance use. Um, uh, about 20% uh, of people with traumatic brain injury um, have substance abuse use issues, um, even compared to general population, and even when and kind of uh, um, excluding other kind of factors. Um, uh, but the the most prominent kind of indicator of substance use is kind of pre-injury factors. So if they're kind of using uh, substances beforehand, they're more likely to use substances afterwards. And it's, it's kind of hard to, to um, uh, for someone who was abstinent, uh, it would be uncommon for them to use substances after their brain injury. Um, but it's an important factor to note because a lot of people um, with substance use, um, uh, they say that it's more, uh, it's more the case that uh, substance use caused um, and, and the impacts of that uh, leads to someone having a traumatic brain injury rather than traumatic brain injury causing substance use. If that kind of makes sense. <laughs> um, it's important to identify uh, substance use uh, because there's a, there is a prominent uh, population of it uh, because it impacts on the recovery process. And then uh, it's usually a good time for intervention. Um, so as before, um, these are, uh, data from the Bureau of Statistics in terms of suicide uh, deaths per 100,000, it's about 11.7. Um, males, more than females. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of traumatic brain injury, even when uh, stratifying for all the other kind of factors, there is a kind of increase. And often um, in these patients uh, with traumatic brain injury, the kind of risk factors for suicide are there anyway. It's more common to, to be male, to be in the age group of 25 to 44. Um, to have uh, kind of if they've got kind of pre-mortem mental health issues, um, uh, these are kind of a general risk anyway in the general population, um, and uh, it's important uh, to to watch out for these because uh, uh, we've got to put in kind of preventive measures. Um, so I'd like to finish uh, just by reiterating the kind of principles of uh, medication prescribing, um, and uh, to keep these kind of in mind. Uh, um, before kind of commencing an antidepressant or anything like that. Any questions? Well, um, yes. After the traumatic brain injury, like, yes. uh, usually, you know, when you ask to see patients, you know, they can find criteria for you know, major or minor depression. Yes. Like, um, that period of time before you start thinking about giving that present, or you just go there and because oh, it's like psychotherapy is not available because you're yeah. them two weeks after. Yeah. They're, low and more, they're not participating in the rehab. Yeah. They're not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, I, I think it's a case-by-case case basis. Um, we kind of talk to them. We kind of talk to the family. Um, generally, we don't kind of uh, do things on kind of cross-sectional type assessment. Uh, we like to see a patient over kind of longitudinal time. So we want to kind of find out about them, what they were like as a child and and their pre morbid kind of past history, um, their personality structure. Um, you see, we usually see them over a, a period of a few assessments, um, and uh, um, because we're kind of wary of, of the impacts they can have in terms of uh, effects on memory and things like that, um, uh, we, we're a bit more cautionary before we kind of prescribe our antidepressants. Um, and if there's kind of other non pharmacological things we can do, like a psychological therapy, then we try to pursue that. Um, but if, say, it's indicated, say, they've had that two-week period, um, they're kind of not responding to psychological therapies, then it's not un too unreasonable to kind of um, see if there is a benefit from studying antidepressants. Mm. Of the all, 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 all right, what's the best one in terms of side effects? Oh, so, so in terms of the best ones, so the one with the kind of least uh, anticholinergic effects are your um, uh, sertraline, as well as fluoxetine or citalopram. So usually SSRI is kind of the first line you go. Right. Yes. Okay. What, what, what patient is moderate or severe brain injury? Is it considered a brain injury for antidepressant? Mm. Yes, if it's indicated, yes. So, how do you differentiate if it's like a problem from those injury or from the neurochemical disorder? Yes. Often it's very, uh, very difficult <laughs> to kind of differentiate uh, in terms of the symptoms. That's why we kind of see them over a period of time. 
there is a kind of neuropsychiatrist and neuropsychology assessments that can be beneficial as well. Uh, that can they do kind of like barrages of tests to kind of differentiate the, each function. Um, in terms of the main features, um, usually if they talk about uh, guilt or they talk about being hopeless or worthless, then that's a kind of uh, indicator that uh, this is more of a depression rather than a, uh, a kind of a brain injury. And usually if there is a significant kind of focus on death and suicide, then it's more of a kind of depression than, than a kind of, a, uh, rather than the effects of the injury, brain injury. Yeah. Mm. Yes. All right. All good. All right. Thank you very much.